In a similar fashion to the utility sector, the communication sector is primarily thought of as lower growth or moderately slow growth income producers. But if you buy them cheap enough, they can also produce great profits in the long run. Hello, everybody. This is Chuck Carnival, co-founder of FastGraphs, the Fundamentals Analyzer software tool, bringing you another part of my series on the various, on the 11 sectors here. Today, we're going to cover the communication sectors, and we're going to look at seven companies. And as I said in the intro, these are primarily thought of, I, I think of these stocks primarily as income producers. I think of them as, you know, supplementing, you know, maybe a fixed income portfolio or even replacing a fixed income portfolio when interest rates are real low. But, you know, they're, they're not really known to be great growth investments, great total return investments. But if you can buy them cheap enough, they can also be that. And I think I found seven here that we can look at. Keep in mind, I'm looking for value in this sector. And these are, you know, I screened out stocks that were overvalued in the sector. And I also primarily looked at U.S. and Canadian companies, but I included a couple international stocks in this particular video just to give you some indication of how they these sectors look like even in different countries. Anyway, let's go into fast graphs and get started. The seven companies I found in the communication sector are, of course, Verizon and AT&T. These are the primary ones in the U.S. Interesting one to look at is Shutterstock because it's really different than all the rest. Stingray Group is the is a Canadian company I'm not real familiar with, but it's been undervalued for a long time. Publicis Group is a French company. It's one of the ones I threw in here from a different country to give you some perspective. Omnicon is kind of a more growthy version of this sector, but it has lower yield, as you can see. And then Nippon Telegraph and Telephone, which is a Japanese, but it's an A-rated company. You can see the dividend yields here range from a low of 2.24% for a shutter stock in Nippon. And then we start getting some pretty attractive yields as we go up, up the food chain here and we get up to 7% in Verizon and, and six and three quarter percent approximately in American Telephone. Before I get into these companies though, I do want to bring up the S&P 500 here, the ETF trust, the Spider S&P 500 trust, because I do want to make a point and I try to make this point in most of these videos, I'm looking for value. This is the S&P 500. Theoretically, a 15 PE is a great valuation reference that also includes a margin of safety that gives you an earnings yield of 6.6%, .6 et cetera. The market's normal PE has been about 18 and a half, you know, going back here to the beginning of 2003. All right, so when I put price on the graph, you'll see this relationship. So this is the earnings per share of that of all the composites here of the ETF, you know, adjusted for time weighted and dollar weighted. So when I put price on the graph, you can see that 18 and a half PE was a very strong valuation reference. We had a couple of down years coming into the recession of 08 and 09, but we still commanded an 18 PE. But just because it had a normal PE doesn't mean you make money. I want you to understand that. Then coming out of the recession, it kind of held that 18-ish PE ratio, if you will. But then we got some a period of a couple of years where you could have really bought the S&P 500 with a margin of safety at an attractive valuation. And then it more or less traded at that 18 and a half PE. But then coming into COVID, we, of course, had the COVID crash. But then the ETF recovered dramatically, came back into fair value based on normal P.E. ratio, and is now slightly overvalued based on historical norms with a blended P.E. of 20.68. And again, I would rather be buying it down here at a 15 P.E. I want to make that clear. The times that I would have been interested in buying this ETF was when it was inexpensive. It's a, you know, growth has been about 7.89% and that includes estimate data. All right, so that's what the S&P 500 looks like today. Again, I want to focus you on the fact that it's above the blue line. It should be trading at around 470. It's trading at 471.97. If it was trading on the blue line, I'm going to take price off the graph here for a moment. If it was trading on, on the orange line, the fair value line of 15 P would be 342. The blue line would be about 424. All right, that's down from 471.97. So that's, you know, where the overvaluation is. I bring it up and I'm stressing this so much because I consider the market fully valued to moderately overvalued. 
where the seven stocks I'm going to show you here in this video, I think are undervalued or at least fairly valued. So let's go ahead and go through them in alphabetical order, if you will. And the first one I've done is the, the company headquartered in Japan. It's the Integrated Telecommunication Services in Japan. It's A-rated, has very low debt. But here's what I want you to notice about this particular stock. Its average growth has been about 6.37%. There have been periods when it didn't grow at all. Okay, then it had some pretty strong growth, and that's when it actually commanded some high valuations. As the growth rates you know, increased 47% and 18% and 21%, this period of growth kind of got people you know, willing to pay a higher valuation. Then, of course, we had a, a drop in earnings, only minus 3%, but a flattening, if you will, of earnings. And, of course, the stock price reacted to that. But this has been trading at around 11 times earnings historically. So when I look at forecasting, now I had people say that I was clicking too fast in my comment section of my previous video. So let me make a point. This is the navigation section for fast graphs. Forecasting calculators are right here. If you click on forecasting calculators, it takes you into our forecasting calculator tool. Okay, and here we're looking at Nippon or Nippon with a 14.6% theoretical Graham Dodd formula generated valuation reference with a growth rate only estimated to grow about 3% a year. The normal multiple on this stock has been lower. It's been about 11. All right. So if the stock only grew by the 3% and traded at 11 multiple going forward, this would only generate a 5.7% return. If it actually traded at a more, let's say, attractive or reasonable 14.6 PE, then you know we would see a 17% growth. But there's not a lot of growth in this stock. And I did want to point that out. When you're looking at this company, and I want those of you who are using fast graphs, you know, if, if I use the maximum graph here, I get 9.97, but that's because we have one anomalous year where we had a 200% growth rate. So I want to make it clear, I took that out. And now I've got a normal P.E. of around 11. In other words, the market typically discounts this at a low value. All right, so that's Nippon. The next one I want to talk about is Omnicon. Now, this is a U.S.-based company. It's more of an advertiser than it is telecommunication services. It's had pretty consistent growth at about 7%. Now, that is just slightly below the market of 7.89. I do want to make that clear. So it's 7.17% growth here. In contrast to the stock market, the stock is undervalued. Now, if I looked at this stock, and I'll go into the portfolio here, and I look at Omnicon in our little pop-up, in one year, it's underperformed the market. Over three years, it's dramatically outperformed the market. Five years, it's underperformed it. 10 years it's underperformed it, 15 years it's underperformed it, and 20. Now, the point is that valuation is the real key factor here. So let's go back into Omnicon now. We're only trading at 11.7 PE. That's roughly half of what the market is. It yields 3.24%, which is significantly above the 1.14% that I can currently get in the market. So I do want to make that clear. And, you know, the stock has been trading at these low valuations, but it's been rising. COVID really brought the valuations down to where the PEs got into the single digit level. Now we've had an adjustment up to about 117 it dropped precipitously in you know the, the first part of this year, but now as you can see, it's been recovering pretty nicely. When I go into forecasting here, a 7% expected future growth rate, which is more of the same, typically what the company has grown at historically. And if it trades at a 15 PE, now let's test that real quick on the historical. I want you to note that the stock has traded at PE ratios above 15, for an awful lot of its history, the last four or five years below that. So it's not totally illogical to think the stock can return to a 15 PE, and that would give you a 24% annualized rate of return with a 3.24% dividend yield. And focusing on the dividend very quickly, the dividend has grown at double-digit rates. If you bought this stock 20 years ago with a 1.2% yield, you know today your yield would be 8.4%. You can see how growth yield works. The company's raised its dividend every single year here. All right, so what I like about this stock is it's a good quality stock. It's triple B+. Plus. It does have some debt, but it does have strong cash flows. The company is expected to you know, have decent growth going forward, 7 and 8% growth. You can buy it at a very discounted price. 
So the bottom line is that even though this stock you know, is growing about an average grower, by buying it so inexpensively, you could really do well with the stock. The next stock we're going to look at here is the one in France, Publicis. It's another 7% grower, very similar. I'm not really sure about the dividend record. I think this probably is exchange rates being involved in why, you know, we see what looks like some dividend cuts, but it's got a good steady dividend record. It got very, very inexpensive during the pandemic, as you can see. The P.E. ratio got down to 5 now, since then, it's currently trading at a blended P.E. of 12.29. You can see it's recovered. It normally trades at around a 13 multiple historically, but it also, you know, it's between 13 and 15. I want to make that clear. It's only been in recent years it's traded at a lower multiple. So if I look at this at a 15 multiple, we would get a just, right, just under 20% annualized rate of return over the next two years with a 3.5% dividend that's expected to increase at about 4 or 5%. Using the normal market multiple, which is a much lower valuation for the last five years. This is for the last five years, by the way. If I look at it more long term, it's been 12 or 13 multiple. I want to make that clear. So if I put the 12 multiple in here, it's a 10% you know, rate of return. If I use the, the five-year number, which is what our tool defaults to, then it looks slightly overvalued with almost no rate of return, including dividend income. So again, I want to show you how to analyze these, but the stock is cheap and it's not to me unrealistic that it's moving back towards a 13 to 15 multiple again, which again would give you uh, some pretty decent returns going out for the next two years. You know, double digit 14, 15% return or better. Anyway, that's that's the publicist company. The next one is Stingray. This is a Canadian broadcasting company. Now, by the way, as a fast graphs this group, you could always go into the company's website and then you can you know, learn more about what the company does. They obviously have music channels, radio, 4K, TV channels, karaoke, concerts and shows. So they're kind of a global music, media and technology force, as they point out here. And it's a premium provider of curated direct-to-consumer and business-to-business -business services, including audio, television channels, over 100 radio stations, SVOD content, not sure what that is, 4K, UHD television channels, karaoke products, digital signage, in-store music, and music apps. So it's kind of an interesting little company here. What I found really interesting is it's only been publicly traded, apparently, since 2016, and it was trading at a 15 multiple. Again, it's about a 7.8% grower, offers a 5.54% dividend yield, but it's really been trading at a very discounted valuation here. Even prior to COVID, it got down to an 11 multiple and stayed around 11 multiple. Then during COVID, it got all the way down to a 5 multiple. It's currently trading at a 6.45 multiple, and it stayed that way. Now, people ask this question all the time. So I'm going to kind of spend some time. This is a good example to do it on. If I shorten this time frame to five years, I want you to notice how the normal PE now has dropped to eight. Okay, on the max version, it's 11. What's the difference? Well, the difference is half of the time here, roughly, the stock is traded at higher valuations, even as high as the 20, 21 multiples, 22 multiples. And since COVID, or even prior to COVID, it's been trading at lower multiples, you know, 11 or 12. And since COVID, it's really been trading at single-digit multiple. Now, I'm not really sure why. I'd have to, you know, dig and do research. But if this trade had went back to a 15 multiple like it did initially, the annualized rate of return here would be huge, 63% annual. That's not total. That's annualized. If you look at the normal multiple, which has only been a nine multiple, the stock would generate almost a 34% annualized rate of return. And the stock is currently trading at below a seven multiple. So this is a prime example of how if you buy these stocks cheap enough and are willing to hold them for the long term, you can do, do very, very well with these communication service utility type, you know, companies, if you will. Okay, the next one I'm going to go into here is Shutterstock. Now, Shutterstock, you know, is best known for its, you can buy the various photos and photographs and so on that you can use in, say, social media, YouTube, you know, anything that you're doing like that. So Shutterstock is a kind of an interesting company. But what I really found interesting about this one was the company had absolutely no growth in essence 
you know, coming into COVID. If I use my scroll bar here, this is a member, an analytical tool. It was growing around three and a half percent in the stock. You know, it had its volatility, but it really did nothing over this whole time frame here. Now, as we move forward, all of a sudden the company started paying a dividend and they've raised that dividend, you know, every year since they've had one. The stock was really highly valued up here in the 37 multiple almost in 2021. Then we had this, you know, big correction and the stock has, you know, got really inexpensive even as early as October 27th of this year. But you see, we've had a nice recovery going on and perhaps it's moving back into that 17.89 PE ratio, which is what the expected growth is. Looking at forecasting here, though, we're only expecting 8% growth. So that would make this a 15 multiple company, but that would still generate a very, very attractive total return with above market, but only a 2.28% dividend yield. So the advantage here is you would buying able to buy this stock very inexpensively. That's what makes this an attractive investment now. The long-term growth rate of the company is expected to be negative, but if I went on to Yahoo, I would I found a much higher number. So there's, you know, no one's really given us a, a long term. It only has four analysts following the company, I might point out. And the analyst scorecard has been a little bit sketchy, okay, meaning analysts don't get this right as often as I would like. And again, I think a lot of that has to do with this historical record that has been kind of interesting. It's been, you know, really flat with no dividend. And then all of a sudden to start growing and then start paying a dividend. And yet the stock corrected and now you can buy it very inexpensively. The next on the list, of course, is the final two is going to be the big AT&T and Verizon. Now, neither of these stocks are very fast growers, but I want to basically talk about how to use this tool again. You know, I've got a down year here. So if I shorten the year, the 1.75% growth rate that I'm you know, focusing on right here, if I shorten that to 20 years, see that goes up to 3.38%. The normal multiple has been 123 But using my analytical skills here, I can see that it hasn't been trading at that high a multiple you know, since February of 2018, it's been trading at a much lower multiple. This stock is clearly in a funk, and we all know they spun off the Warner, and they cut their dividend or reduced their dividend, but it's still yielding now 6.74%. It's triple B rated, has moderate amounts of debt, in my opinion, and forecasting looks for it to, you know, only grow at 1.5%. But if it traded at only an 11.5 multiple, you would have a 36% annualized rate of return. But that's, you know, not quite double, but that's getting, you know, a substantial P.E. ratio increase from its current P.E. of 6.76. This stock is very, very cheap, and I don't think it's going anywhere. And you buy this stock for the current income now with the opportunity for it move back up at least to a 12 multiple like it's historically traded at. Okay, so if I go into the normal multiple here, and again, the five-year has been lower, but if I go back and find this, you know, roughly, here's close enough, roughly a 12 multiple, 11.88, you know, you've got a 38, almost 39% annualized rate of return potential with a very, very attractive dividend. AT&T, I believe, is worth consideration if you're looking for income and willing to hold this stock for three to five years, as you should. I think it would be an excellent investment here. The entry point, any of these entry points, I think will prove to be good investment. I want to make that clear. It was cheap here. It got cheaper, and yet it still got cheaper, and now it's starting to show some recovery now. I think any of these times are going to prove to be, over the long run, a good time to be buying AT&T. And then finally, last but not least, is Verizon. And once again, we see a relatively low-growth stock. It has traded at, you know, between 13 and 14 times earnings, 12.7 and 13.7. The blue line is 13.77 times earnings here on this graph. You know, that's, that's the PE. The orange line is 12.7. So this is traded at a relatively low multiple. You can currently buy it at under an eight multiple. It has an earnings yield of 12.5% and a dividend yield of 7% and a really excellent dividend record. If I look at performance and focus on the dividend, they've grown the dividend very consistently at about a 3% rate. Now, they have grown it at a much lower rate for the last five or six years. Again, I'm analyzing what I'm looking at here. So if I drop this you know, to a 10-year graph, then you know my dividend growth has been 2%. 
But the point is, it's been consistent. Okay, it's consistently increased the dividend, although a very low rate, admittedly. But you can get a 7% yield. And if you buy the stock, expecting it to only go to a 9 multiple from an 8 multiple, you can make 11% a year. If you look at the normal multiple of 11 and a half over the last five years, you could be making 25 almost 26% a year annualized. If you go back and go through here again and look at you know, some of these higher multiples that the stock has typically traded at, you could make as much as 36% a year annualized. So these stocks are not for long-term capital gains, although if you buy them cheap enough, as I said in the introduction, you can make some money buying these stocks. These stocks are really about the income and the income they produce. Anyway, this has been Chuck Carnival, co-founder of FastGrass, the Fundamentals Analyzer software tool, looking at the communication services sector here. This would be part six, I think it is, in my videos. Um, I still got a few more to do. I'm probably going to do one or two more this week, and then I'll take a break for the holiday period and, and probably come back and pick up the last three to four sectors in the beginning of the new year. I hope you're enjoying this series. The whole idea here it's not about recommending any of these stocks. It's about understanding the differences of, you know, the attributes that different companies in different sectors and even different subsectors within those sectors, you know, give you. So it's really about, you know, knowledge here. And I've, you know, done screens here that, you know, let me give you some representative companies, but not necessarily all the ones that are fairly valued. Also, to make that clear. Anyway, if you like the video, give me a like. Ring the bell, subscribe to the channel, and take a look at subscribing to Fast Graphs if you don't. It's a great tool that can help you analyze stocks and so that you can invest with your eyes wide open so that you really know what's going on. You got some great historical data, but you also got some powerful forecasting tools that can help you calculate rates of return so you're just not investing blindly. Thanks for watching, and I look forward to showing you my next video.